Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, troubles flaring up again over the San Diego Tourism Marketing Agency. And former city councilman Carl DeMaio makes it official launching his campaign for Congress. I'm Peggy Pico, also ahead a San Diego rally in support of the immigration reform bill. Why the mayor is joining in. Plus... Scripps Institution of Oceanography offers a prestigious award to director James Cameron for his voyage to the bottom of the sea and why they're happy he's giving it back. Also tonight, the Navy says some of its uniforms can go up in flames, what they're planning to do about it. And in part one of a special report, we meet some of San Diego's youngest homeless and tell you about an effort to give them some part of a normal childhood. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego's Tourism Authority says it's suspending operations Monday because Mayor Bob Filner hasn't released the funding it needs to make payroll. Filner says he will withhold the money until the agency honors a commitment to help fund the upcoming centennial celebration at Balboa Park. It's the latest flap in a dispute many thought was settled about six weeks ago when Filner signed an agreement with the agency. It included 5% of TMD revenue for the centennial event, but the mayor says it hasn't worked out that way. Right now, they are not living up to the agreement. They have not given the 5%. They, don't, they say they're not intending to do it. They said you're going to get the leftovers. I want that money because it's so important to our community to give the money off the top. And when they do that, uh, the agreement will says they'll get the rest of their money. Now, the Tourism Marketing District says it's committed to funding the Centennial, but the money uh, was available was less than Filner actually wanted. The board plans to discuss its next step at a meeting tomorrow. A brief fire scare in the Far East County today in the Witch Creek area, southwest of Santa Isabel. The brush fire started at about 2 this afternoon. Firefighters had it under control within an hour. No structures were threatened. It burned about 20 acres. Former San Diego City Councilman and mayoral candidate Carl DeMaio is running for Congress next year, hoping to unseat the recently elected Democrat Scott Peters in the 52nd District. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser talked with DeMaio about some of the issues he'll run on. Claire, so what's he going to focus on this time around? Well, just like when he was running for mayor, DeMaio is again going to focus on the budget and the economy. But this time it's the federal budget. He says he'll tackle the federal budget gap by keeping every program on the table for potential cuts. He also says he'll cut government red tape to help businesses create jobs. Yeah, similar themes to his mayoral campaign, but will he have a better chance of winning the race for Congress than he did mayor? Well, it's interesting. Uh, historically, the 52nd District has been more conservative, which would be in DeMaio's favor. But redistricting helped shift the district to a more even split between Democrats and Republicans. After the 2012 election of Scott Peters, our partner iNewsource made a map that showed that district. And almost two-thirds of the precincts that favored Scott Peters also favored Carl DeMaio for mayor. So that might, just, might suggest DeMaio has better chances of winning. Or at least he could be, it, the race could be more interesting, I guess. We'll have to find out next year. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser. Petitions against hydraulic fracking were delivered to San Diego Assemblywoman Tony Atkins today. The liberal group Move On organized a statewide petition drive to protest the controversial method to extract oil. It could be not only dangerous to our air, but all too so to our water supply because it's known to pollute not only the groundwaters, but streams and rivers that run in the area. Supporters of fracking say it could make California the nation's top oil producer. The legislature is considering several bills to limit the practice. State Senate has rejected a bill to phase out plastic shopping bags. They would have been banned at larger stores throughout California by 2015, but opponents said the bill would put hundreds of people out of work. Plastic shopping bags are already banned in Solana Beach. 
Another rally in support of the immigration reform bill will be held tonight in San Diego. Peggy Pico is back. She's taking a look at the odds of it passing. The immigration reform bill now moves to the Senate for a vote next month. But even if it passes there, it faces more challenges with a risk of defeat in the House, as some Congress members call it an amnesty bill. Joining me with a few predictions and how the rally hopes to sway Congress are my guests, Carl Luna, political science professor at Mesa College, and Rhoda Quaite, team leader for the group Organizing for Action. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Rhoda, what provisions in this bill are most important to immigrants? Immigrants here in San Diego. The most important uh, provisions in this bill for the immigrants here is the, uh, the 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 pathway to citizenship for the 11 million people that are currently um, in in limbo in this country. Um, if we can get if they can receive uh, be documented, that will uh, will help out tremendously. So just the just the fact that uh, a bill will pass will allow them to come out of the shadows, which is what they really need to uh, to do. And Carl, how about let's move on to the, the San Diego's congressional delegation. Where do they stand on this uh, reform bill? It's the usual suspects. Three Democrats in our delegation are going to be voting for the bill, or at least whatever form they can get coming out of the House. Two members probably voting against anything that's too lenient in terms of anything like an amnesty. Uh, so you'll get immigration reform or immigration reform light if it gets that far. Okay, let's talk business. Now, mm -hmm. I understand um, this is going to be downtown, this rally that's just going to be happening very shortly. Yes. Um, why are San Diego businesses interested, and which side of the fence do they stand on from your perspective? Uh, well, businesses understand that um, the immigration reform bill will um, greatly uh, benefit um, businesses in San Diego and all over the country. And um, one, of the, one of the reasons uh, for that is uh, the types of people that come here uh, from the country, from other countries, uh, that have that have cro that made that crossing um, are e extremely determined, um, very 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 hardworking. Um, they're the they're the types that uh, will push themselves to create new businesses, which also helps create helps the economy create new jobs. They're motivated. They're motivated very in motivated the job people. sense. When it comes to lawmakers, Carl, um, who the people who are against this bill, like you said, along party lines, what are they saying as to why they oppose it? Well, part of it's a moral issue. You know, people broke the law, so you don't want to reward bad behavior, the moral hazard, and it could encourage further uh, illegal immigration. Part of it's straight-up political calculation. If you have 11 million undocumented workers, the assumption is a number of them, if they become citizens, are going to vote for the other party. They're not going to vote for the Republican Party. Part of it is looking at uh, jobs, labor unions, afraid you'll lose jobs to uh, lower-paid workers. So there's a lot of moving pieces to this. More people now see a benefit of moving forward with some form of immigration reform than you've had for years. So I'm optimistic, as optimistic as I get, that something might actually pass. Including, you know, who else is optimistic? Uh, Senator Majority Leader Harry Reid. He says he expects this bill to pass. Do you think, do you agree with him? It's, uh, you know, the Senate version is probably going to pass. Then the question is, what does the House version look like? And does it end up dying in uh, conference? Republicans in the House who might not want this bill to pass don't want their fingerprints on it so they don't pay, an, uh, pay a big political price if they're accused of killing it. Now, House Speaker John uh, Boehner says he's not going to rubber stamp this. He's going to come up with his own idea. Do you think rallies like the ones going on tonight could influence him? Absolutely. I mean, I, all over the country, we're having an incredible sentiment towards pro-immigration reform. And more and more Americans are realizing that there's no benefit to having these people live in the shadows and the, the difficulty that they endure um, living that way. So I think that uh, when rallies like this just simply uh, are able to expose uh, uh, publicize how much uh, public support there is for this kind of a bill. All right. Well, I want to let people know about this uh, rally. So thank you both very much for this update of information. If you want to attend, you've still got a few minutes to get there. The rally starts at 7 p.m. tonight. It's on the west side in front of the San Diego County Administration Building downtown. The county health agency is telling uh, parents to get their children vaccinated after an outbreak of chicken pox at an elementary school in Carlsbad. Five children and an adult got the uh, disease. Only one of the children was vaccinated. The newly expanded emergency department at UC San Diego Medical Center got put to the test, taking part in a countywide disaster preparedness drill. The scenario was a building collapse with dozens of injuries. Part of effective preparedness includes planning and also drills. 
we do a, different types of drills at different levels of response, and we do this to ensure the hospital is ready. UCSD and other local hospitals stage drills like these uh, three times a year. The Navy is phasing in flame-resistant clothing for every sailor who goes to sea. Apparently, the Navy tested its current work uniforms and found they're very flammable. It will take about three years to get new flame-resistant clothes out to sailors. Marines and Army personnel already have the clothing. Mayor Filner was uh, talking about youth jobs at a downtown summit today, calling on businesses to take part in Connect Two Careers. It's a project designed to give work experience to young folks who've already been vetted by San Diego's Workforce Partnership. We're asking employers to take, it, to take advantage of the process that we have gone through and allow these kids to uh, learn a career, to stay off the streets during the summer, uh, to be motivated for further academic work, and to, to learn what it is to, uh, to, to work uh, in the outside world. Filner says 400 students are enrolled in the program. Half of them already have job offers. A growing number of homeless children are spending their nights in a San Diego emergency shelter and their days on the streets. In the first part of a two-part series, KPBS reporter Susan Murphy tells us about a push for a preschool to keep these young children safe. Baby Rebecca is about the only one smiling this morning at the Women and Children's Emergency Homeless Shelter. That's because it's 5.30 and it was a long night. 36 children and 43 women slept side by side on blanket-covered mattresses laid out like a puzzle on the floor. Yeah? Wow. You just want kisses? They stayed at the downtown San Diego Rescue Mission because they had nowhere else to go. I need you to head to the elevator, please. Every morning, they hustle to get ready, pack their bags, and go downstairs for breakfast. Today, it's biscuits, eggs, and potatoes. They eat up with one eye on the clock. The older children have to get to school, but the babies and toddlers face a tough day with mom on the streets. Children are one of the fastest growing segments of the U.S. homeless population. According to the National Coalition for the Homeless, 1.2 million children nationwide are homeless on any given night. In San Diego, 2,400 children stayed in emergency or transitional shelters last year. Half were under the age of six. The rescue mission sheltered 683 of those children in its emergency facility, up from 487 two years ago. The ability to supervise multiple children while you're on the street is, for the best mom, difficult. For some of our moms, it's impossible. Sherry Hauser is vice president of programs at the rescue mission. She says the shelter is only licensed to be open from 7 at night to 7 in the morning. For 12 hours during the day, moms with little ones are on their own. Hauser says most families end up in nearby parks or wandering the streets of downtown. Because they're out and they're not connected to our facility when they leave, I'm not sure how much we don't know. Hauser says she does know one of the shelter's five-year-old boys was recently hit by a car as he was leaving the shelter and that children are at risk of many other dangers. And then there's some of our moms who are in abusive relationships and then when they leave here, they go try to get you know, someplace to stay for a day and the kids are seeing abuse, they're seeing sexual abuse, they're seeing drugs. The rescue mission often extends its 30-day emergency shelter limit because waiting lists for longer-term shelters like St. Vincent de Paul and Cortez Hill Family Center are currently two to four months long. In 2010, waiting lists averaged three to four weeks. After a long day, 24-year-old Robin Gorman checks back into the San Diego Rescue Mission's emergency shelter with her two kids, one-year-old Rebecca and two-and-a-half-year-old Joshua. Little Rebecca's smile has faded. That's hard with both kids, stroller, bags. Yeah. Gorman and her kids have stayed at the shelter for seven weeks. She says she tries to make each day an adventure at the park. Uh, I usually lay a blanket, put some toys on it. Um, I, I go to the center so that they're not like right by the street or by the sidewalk. <laughs> Other moms say they spend their days in line for welfare services with their kids strapped in their strollers much of the day. The sun is getting ready to go down, but for many of these children, it's the first time all day that they've had a chance to play. This courtyard filled with bikes and scooters and a basketball hoop is their backyard, but it's only open for about an hour each day. 
Sherry Hauser says there's an urgent need for a preschool or daycare center at the rescue mission for moms like Gorman. She's helping to put a proposal in motion. So this would be, I think, a major step towards providing some kind of normal childhood for them. And their childhood hasn't been normal. They sleep in a shelter. <laughs> Hauser envisions a beautiful classroom and modern playground equipment where children have a daily routine, nurturing teachers and healing. I want it to be the kind of preschool that you would walk in as a mom or any mom would walk in and say, wow, I would put my kid there. And I want it to be something that they remember in the cycle of homelessness that was okay. <laughs> Gorman says a daycare would allow her to go back to school. I could know that they're safe, they're taken care of, and even if they miss me, they're still, they're not alone. And I would just, I'd be able to go on with what I need to do so that we can, you know, get out of the situation. Until then, she says she's grateful when the shelter doors open and a warm meal is served. Ah, big mouth. After dinner, shelter residents return to the overcapacity bedroom walls to set up their mattresses and get ready for bed. Where do I go? Where's my bed? Everyone is hoping for some sleep and that one night soon will be their last night of homelessness. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. And tomorrow we'll show you what it's like for a homeless family with a baby out on the street all day. Avatar and Titanic director James Cameron is being honored by Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Peggy Pico finds out why he's giving the $25,000 award money back. Scripps Institution of Oceanography teamed up with director James Cameron last year to reach the deepest part of the Mariana Trench. It took Cameron 90 minutes to reach the bottom, seven miles below the surface. Take a look. Joining me to talk about that adventure and Scripps' prestigious Nuremberg Award and why Cameron is giving it back is Scripps' chief scientist of the Deep Sea Challenge Expedition, Doug Bartlett. Thank you so much for being here, Doug. My pleasure. Why is traveling to basically an inverted Mount Everest uh, important to the public? How does that benefit the public? This represents the alien-like environment where we know life exists. We know we can learn about subduction processes and adaptation to extremes of pressure and low temperature and absence of sunlight. So there's much to be learned. We don't know all that we'll learn, but we know that there's lots of life and we know that there's lots of geology waiting to be discovered. Now this deep sea challenge, uh, tell us when it started and um, what the goal is. Mm -hmm. The expedition embarked in mid-February of 2012. We started in Papua New Guinea, so we did engineering tests off of the island of New Britain, and then we went on to the, the, the Challenger Deep. And this, this little mini submarine that we're seeing right now, that green submarine. That's right, that beautiful lime green su submarine. And the, the challenge was to design a submersible that could go full ocean depth and to use that sub and additional instruments with the sub to generate new scientific information. Which you did. Now, this is kind of dangerous. You were saying about 15,000 pounds per square inch was the pressure inside of that little tiny uh, a, a capsule. Uh, danger hasn't been done before. What'd you learn? Mm -hmm. Yes, D dangerous, um, involved new technology. There was new buoyancy material, new kind of cylinder, with the way it was connected to the sub. The 
the great LED lights and, and the battery power, the lithium ion batteries, everything was new. It was entirely custom designed. So from an engineering point of view, there were tre tremendous advances made. We're looking at a, a map right now um, of the Marianas Trench. Where is it? It's southwest of the island of Guam in the western Pacific. It's uh, about uh, 200, 230 miles or so southwest of Guam in the Federated States of Micronesia. All right, so it looks it looks deep from the map, so just from, from what we know of it. Now, James Cameron says that he'll uh, give the Nuremberg Prize money, $25,000, back to Scripps to establish the Lander Lab at the institution. What is a Lander mm -hmm. Lab? Well, landers are instruments that can be used autonomously from the ship, not connected to the ship. They're... They're not manned. They're instruments that drop down, do lots of things. In this case, generated lots of beautiful video and attracted animals and collected animals and all sorts of things. And the, the, the lander lab that James Cameron is, is catalyzing the creation of um, will allow us to continue where we left off with Deep Sea Challenge, to make new landers, to go off and explore all those trenches that are waiting to be um, uh, really uh, investigated in detail. Well, we can't wait to hear more about it. Scripps Institution of Oceanography Sciences, Doug Bartlett, thanks so much. For My pleasure. Me. Thank you, Peggy. There was a time when they were as much a part of the character of San Diego as the zoo or Balboa Park. I'm talking about the auto and passenger ferry boats going back and forth from San Diego to Coronado a half century ago. One man went on a very personal journey to see the final days of one of those ferry boats. Ken Kramer has the story in tonight's About San Diego. When ferry boats crossed between San Diego and Coronado, there was one that became a favorite. Joe Ditler remembers that boat called the San Diego. You know, it was one of the big uh, old-fashioned uh, slab-sided, double-decked uh, ferry boats that you, you see uh, up in the Pacific Northwest. Now the thing about these ferry boats, up until 1969 when the bridge opened, they carried you and your car. They were just a part of living and commuting back and forth across the bay. The way they looked, the sounds and smells of riding them, as a kid back then, Joe fell in love with all of that. It's funny, the ferry boats just had some spell on, on, on me anyway, and so many others really too, but you just didn't want it to be over, you didn't want it to end. But when the bridge did open, the ferry boats were sold and the San Diego, this boat, was sold too. And the San Diego uh, ended up going to uh, the Pacific Northwest where it operated for a few more years and um, then it was retired. There was talk that maybe she'd come home to our county, be a floating dinner theater, but no, she was in decline, tied up along the Sacramento River. There was a series of um, fires on board and uh, a bunch of artists lived on board and it, the, the ship just kept going down and down and down. Finally, word came that the San Diego would be scrapped. For Joe, it was sad, all those sweet memories of this ship and what she meant to so many people. The whole ritual of getting on board and riding across the bay had so much simple charm. As a writer, journalist, and historian, he right away made plans to go north to take a last look. I wanted to go up and, and document it. I thought this was all important, but I think the real thing for me was one last walk on the decks of this ferry boat. Okay. Still up on the top deck. What he found was really just a shell of the old ship he remembered from his youth. There was no ship's helm. There was no engine telegraph. Uh, the name boards, and she had lovely name boards. You know, she had them all over the place. They were all gone. Uh, the anchors, the chain, there was nothing left. Coming down, I'll pan a little bit over to this funnel that Joe was getting hesitant about taking home in his rented van. And then I'll come back one more time and catch Joe checking out the old stack. He did look around for anything that might be put on display back in Coronado. He found some pulleys used to lower the lifeboats. When we came by, they were being shown at the library along with other items from the San Diego and some things on loan from the Maritime Museum. There was a scale model of the San Diego. For those who never experienced the ferry boats, who never knew what it was like, Joe's trip to see the final days of this one might seem a strange thing. But not if you rode them, not if they were a part of you. It all came back to him as he stood on the San Diego's deck just one last time. I began to just have this flood of memories, and I'm telling you, I could hear the slushing of the water as they approached the pilings in the far shore. They'd throw it in the reverse, you could hear the bells. From the, from the captain down to the engine room, and then they would respond. Ding, 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 full reverse. 
Um, you could hear the water. You could hear the propellers change direction. You could hear the pilings creak, and you could smell the creosote on the pilings. Um, it was the craziest thing. I mean, here I am on this abandoned, dead boat that really looks nothing like she did in her prime. And yet all these things were flooding back into my mind, and it was a, it was a very moving experience, and I'm so glad that I went up and was able to have that last experience on the ferry boat San Diego. So we bid you adieu, San Diego. At last she was towed ever so slowly to the scrapyard. This is the last video of the ferry boat countless thousands of us remember. Within the next couple of days, she was torn apart and that was the end. And so she's gone. And it was a very, it was a very um, sad thing to watch. Joe ended up writing three articles about the end of the San Diego and there were hundreds of responses, people wanting to share their memories of a time gone by. Their first kiss, riding on the ferry boat at night where you could ride for a quarter all night. When the pace of life was slower, when the wind and tide were part of the commute, when so many things were so very different about San Diego. If you want to see more of Ken's stories about San Diego, his show can be seen tonight and every Thursday at 8, right here on KPBS. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.